This is the agenda, so we're going to talk about higher education in the U.S. and some various topics related to agile, digital DevOps edu and education and the intersection. We're going to talk about the report and a modern digital course. Um, you can download the report right now from your devices for free. It's at dynamicit.education, not edu, .education, dynamicit. I have hard copies up here you can also get after the talk, about 40 there. Um, the download will ask for an email. It's completely non-commercial. We are building a community list, but it is um, curated by the, the uh, Minnesota State Colleges and University system. Anybody play Oregon Trail? All right, well, on behalf of the great state of Minnesota, you're welcome. This was the product of the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium to which this report is dedicated. It also, MEC also did things like put model 33 ASR teletypes in junior high school and high school classrooms throughout the state. The first time I died of dysentery, it was printed out on yellow continuous paper on a device like this in Mr. Stedman's science classroom at Ramsey Junior High, which was also where I learned to program an HP timeshared basic on a, share, a time sharing HP 2000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so it's really easy when you're talking about higher education to find articles like this. Plight of the Public University, New York Times this Sunday, right? But let's get real. Traditional pu full-time public higher education is not going to fade away overnight in favor of MOOCs, distance education, coding boot camps, or unschooling, or what have you. If lack of talent is a problem for you and your digital organization, I would suggest it's crazy to ignore a system of such scale and scope. Roughly a trillion dollars in capital and half a trillion in annual run rate, 20 million students a year, 4 million employees. This is a big chunk of our economy, folks. And through tax advantages and state appropriations, it's a chunk we pay for. People want to send their kids away for a few years to learn. It's been a thing since the Middle Ages or something. Of the 20 million, where are they going? They're going to big state university systems, 71% of them still, like the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities system, recently rebranded just to Minnesota State. 30 colleges, seven universities, 54 locations, 400,000 students, the fifth largest in the uh, country. New Directions is the annual educator industry conference. Um, Advanced IT is the center of excellence. We had Nicole Forsgren come in and keynote this year, which is where we kicked off this whole report, was uh, kicked off this spring at, the, at, the, uh, at this Advanced uh, IT event. So first we did a survey. Um, 159 uh, industry and educational professionals responded on topics like agile, DevOps, and workforce. A couple highlights. Um, of the industry professionals, 62% um, are now considering agile skills as a factor. And this is where it's interesting. Half of those only started doing so in the last three years. So it's like we're in the tornado. The uptake of agile and the recognition of agile as a workforce thing is, is increasing dramatically. Um, in terms of continuous delivery, 78% of our respondents viewed it as either emerging or mainstream. Only 45% of schools are recognizing it at all. Um, and by the way, if these are biased in any direction, it's self-selected people who are interested in the topic, so numbers are likely a little lower. 65% um, of the education professionals we, we surveyed said, hey, our system's doing just fine as far as uh, preparing a digital workforce but only 32% of the industry folks agreed, which is not surprising. So moving on to some other sources, in terms of what industry is looking for, what are the needs of the new digital workforce? So for what's the nature of the programmers we require? Y Combinator, the startup incubator, in a survey of what startups need, they noticed that programmers, their startups were hiring programmers with a strong product focus far and away the most desired, not the technical programs focused on things like algorithms and data structures, the customer focused, user experienced focused, pro product oriented programs almost twice as much in demand. 
And where do we get these product-oriented programmers? Well, this is where we start to see the structural problems in the education system. So this is the University of Minnesota. My wife and I have five degrees from there. Go Gophers. My wife is the smart one with the PhD in geology, just to be clear. Um, notice the Carlson School, way over here, and computer science, about as far away as we can get from the business school, with this big river thing in the middle. Now let's riff a little bit on Conway's law. <laughs> Organizations which design systems tend to produce copies of the communication structures, right? The University of Minnesota is, in a sense, designing our workforce and what could possibly go wrong here if we are trying to create product-oriented technologists. <laughs> so we'll return to this question of how disciplinary boundaries are set. I pivot a little bit to a specific practice. One theme I've certainly heard, at least anecdotally, from many hiring managers, the students are coming out of school and they don't even know version control or source control. How many of, that, how many of you have had that experience with new hires? Okay, yeah, quite a few. Majority of our, the educators that were surveyed, and again, these were biased to people who actually might have been more favorable to it, they don't provide any practical experience in version control. State of DevOps report suggests it's one of the factors most correlated with digital delivery performance. Ultimately, I'll, I'll draw an analogy, interested in feedback. I kind of compare it to hygienic practices in healthcare. Interns and residents in the medical community are expected to know how to sanitize, why they do so, and to have actually to do it on an ongoing basis as a practice. There's a practical expectation throughout the healthcare community, and it's grounded in an important theory, the germ theory of disease. I'd suggest that source control is our equivalent to hygiene, and certainly, you know, draw, noticing Andrew Clay Schaefer's quote that I've used in a million times over, it's the foundation of every other agile technical practice. Hard to argue that one. So why do we have the educational structures that we do? Specific decisions were and are being made under the auspices of well-known organizations that many of us support through membership. I'm a member of all three of these. Uh, and, uh, and through tax exemption. They've got the social mandate to do this. These are the major players. The IEEE, which handles the engineering side, the Association for Information Systems, which handles the B-School MIS side, and the Association for Computing Machinery, which acts like an overall umbrella and coordination role. This group, it's largely responsible for how the computing-related disciplines are structured in the U.S. at least. Now, other countries have different players, like the British Computer Society and the U.K., for example. I'm being very U.S.-centric in this presentation. So they got together in 2005, and this is based on previous work, but I'll just focus on the current cohort of reports. They said there will be five, computer engineering, computer science, software engineering, information systems, and information technology. And the B schools get MIS, the C schools and the engineering schools get CE, CS, and software engineering, and IT is kind of all over the map and often not taught at top tier schools. Once scoped, further working groups on the right, these, these doc, the four documents on the right here, have been produced on a rolling basis for years. And when you dig into these reports, you see very interesting assumptions, including very clear statements, for example, that CS majors need to know next to nothing about business matters, including product management. It's all at this URL here. If you want to see where the education system is, is defining itself in the curriculum, just go to that URL. And this deck will be on SlideShare. So I know this is an eye chart. There's a lot of detail here. You can come back to this. This is an excerpt from matrices, extensive matrices in the 2005 report that set the disciplinary boundaries. Scale from zero to five is used to indicate how much graduates from each degree are expected to know across 50 or so different knowledge areas, both core computing and contextual um, um, related areas. And basically, you can read this as saying, MIS majors do business requirements, business models, business performance, including presumably product management, and CSI majors analyze technical requirements and do techie stuff. The business stuff is almost completely zeroed out for them. Essentially, what I would argue and propose to you is, is that we have put, we have baked waterfall into the fundamental curricular and disciplinary structure. 
of, US, of higher education. We plan it with IS, we build it with CSI and SE, and we run it with IT. It's the CSI degree, well, here, oh, I'm sorry, backing up. I've been hearing at least anecdotal evidence, including discussions with my dean and industry associations in Minnesota, that the IS and IT degrees in particular aren't as well regarded by digital hiring managers. It's that top tier CSI degree that is viewed as the gold standard by hiring managers in industry, including companies like major Minnesota retailers that didn't used to see themselves as technology hirers. And now they do. So there's kind of a wrink, couple wrinkles here. I spoke with senior staff, faculty, senior faculty at the, in the CSI department of U of M, and he's like, Charlie, CS departments in schools like mine are incented to produce researchers. That is their social function. Now we've got industry saying more, 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 more. And so the CSI departments, there's an article, I think it was an IEEE computer, um, are under pressure to increase the volumes of computing grads up to 50% or more, but I think industry is going to start demanding a different profile from these grads who are coming out, again, not knowing source control, not knowing product development, not knowing anything about operations. So let's look at, I want to be a little more precise, I want to be very careful, you know, as we, as we have, you know, these conversations with academia about what this report is and is not about. The core stuff on the, on the left, discrete math, fundamentals of computation, automata, operating systems, compilers and languages, not talking about any of that. It's great stuff, you need it, you need your people to know it, go knock yourself out, you know, and not criticizing or suggesting any changes there. I'm not qualified to, be very clear. It's the contextual courses, project management, requirements management. I mean, a software engineering or even a CSI program might require three credits of project management, and this is in a day and age when companies are shutting down their PMOs in favor of continuous flow approaches. So what are we gonna do about that? I mean, is, should we keep doing that? We've got these big batch, three credits of requirements, three credits of architecture, three credits of software quality assurance. I mean, we've baked waterfall both into the disciplinary boundaries as well as the computing curricula. So operations shunted off at best to the IT degree, and yet here you've got the site reliability engineering folks calling for CSI majors in operations, where you've got CSI majors that are going to come in, landing in organizations with heavy-duty operational aspects, high-flow, customer-driven digital pipelines, and out of the current curricula, they land in like, what? This isn't what I went to school for, <laughs> you know? And sure, are there institutions that are better? You know, there's variability in the institutions. Some of you may say, well, the schools I know, they're actually starting to get, but this is workforce, folks. This is about the eight million. You know, this is about the broad structures, and the broad structures are defined and influenced by these artifacts we're looking at here. Final note on this slide. In Europe, there's this thing called informatics, and we have that here too, at UC Irvine, Indiana, Northwestern, maybe a few other places. I'm wondering, I'm not ready to suggest, but I'm wondering if the informatics degree really is kind of the vehicle that might, we might be able to move forward on. Just the beginning of a conversation. So let's turn to the report. So here it is, I've got 40 copies here. You're welcome to take one, and there is also a URL where you can download it. You can download it even now if you want it, dynamicit.education. This is how we structured it. First, we provide an overview of the agile DevOps and digital context, and we give people lots of references to think about. We talk about the historic failure of the capability maturity model, the emergence of empirical process control. We talk about origins of agile, 10 deploys a day. We define five competency areas that I think could be considered by any computing related discipline. We'll talk about those later. Finally, we make some specific recommendations for adapting and creating new courses and conclude with some thoughts on digital labs and simulations. I wanna be very, very clear. This report is not prescriptive. The report specifically says it would be ironic and presumptuous to attempt to mandate a standard Agile curriculum. What we are trying to do is provide a resource for teaching faculty, busy teaching faculty across the US who otherwise might be blindsided by the movement coming out of conferences like this. These folks do need some help and they need some resources. 
So going into the competency areas, the first one we talk about is uh, dynamic infrastructure operations. The competency areas break down into categories, competency categories, competencies themselves, and we put lots of learning objectives for course designers to consider as a reference, all cited, mostly cited with respect to industry literature, a lot of O'Reilly books and stuff. This is about virtualization, cloud, infrastructure as code, site reliability engineering, operational practices. We bring in John Allspot, Tom Limoncelli, Google SRE book by Betsy Beyer et al. and more. Continuous delivery is the second major competency area. We talk about, it's not DevOps because DevOps is a bit too broad. Um, we uh, talk full stack, full life cycle, and the learning objectives here relate to core agile, um, as well as continuous integration, continuous delivery, and of course the state of DevOps research uh, gets, a, gets a, a, bit of, a bit of attention and love here. Product management, we've got 85,000 Scrum product owners, all created by commercial training. So what should new ones learn in school? Should there be an academic response to you? What about the product-focused devs that the Y Combinator companies want? If I want to go into this as a field, what do I do? What do I need? Amazing huge gap. Faculty, we suggest, for faculty, we suggest Marty Kagan, Steve Blank, Jeff Patton, Jeff Gothelf, design thinking folks, and also note that the existing UI and user experience courses that already exist in curricula might be decent places to start. Fourth competency area is resource and execution. Now this is kind of a common abstract area to discuss both project and process in a generic sense. We need a better language for discussing and analyzing these questions. Things are a little too religious right now. You get DevOps versus ITIL, no estimates, no projects, safe versus less, Scrum versus Kanban. I want a more clinical, I suggest we need a more clinical terminology and a big hat tip to Don Reinertsen. I would much rather talk about things like cadence and synchronization and batch size, queuing, specialization, skill versus product alignment. All of the themes you hear at this conference when people you know they're really engaging with this problem. So, and then finally, organization and culture. Students need to be able to assess whether they're in a culture that's ultimately gonna support high performance. Organizations need to know that too. And we can quantify this. It's not woo-woo stuff anymore. I mean, that's very clear from the conversations here, right? So we call out Project Aristotle, state more of the state of DevOps work, and so on. Now, one of the things we often hear is, is that tech moves too fast and that we're going to get into vocationalism. But ultimately, this is not about let's teach the latest version of Jenkins. There's a big tectonic shift going on here in the transition to continuous flow and continuous delivery. And so I do think that this is something that is appropriate now for academic attention. And I'd say to the, you know, the, and, and certainly for two and four year teaching colleges, well, they are supposed to do vocational and workforce uh, teaching. So what's the problem with being vocational? And I'd suggest for the researchers, that you think you couldn't create hundreds of PhDs out of the questions and concepts being discussed at this conference? My God, I mean, it's an immensely rich narratives and conversations we're having here um, that absolutely could, could be uh, um, uh, researched. So, so much for learning objectives. Don't have time to go into the whole report here. Time is slipping away, away quite quickly. So as we look at updating pedagogy, Few things, it's not easy to create net new courses. The report suggests various ways in which we could adapt them. For example, continuous integration and delivery could be brought into SQA, a software quality assurance course, if you're not ready to actually get rid of the course. Um, but I think product management and operations probably call for new courses. I haven't seen too, many, too much evidence of, of, of those um, out there, not that I've reviewed every syllabus in the, in the country. Um, and we also suggest interdepartmental collaboration. So get the CSI and B-School people talking and get students from both sides working together. Um, we also go into virtualization, uh, virtual labs and simulations, and a bit more on that in a bit. So turning to the micro, this is my course at the University of St. Thomas. Um, it's essentially a broad IT management survey course. It uses a scaling model as a primary learning progression with also a flipped model where people view lecture video online and in classes all lab based and experiential. Um, and uh, the lab approach is what I call full stack, full life cycle. Well, what do I mean by that? So we've taught, we teach IT using two narratives. We use either a stack narrative 
say this depends on this depends on this, and we either teach it bottom up if you're C psi or top down if you're B school, or we teach the life cycle, i.e. kind of waterfall. Now, the, both of these narratives have some important educational aspects, but they both have limitations. And so the narrative that I'm suggesting as a learning progression that I use, I call the emergence model for my current book. And my students love it because everybody can relate to Larry and Sergey in the garage creating Google. I mean, you can sell you know, the, the, the incoming students on, hey, let's, let's have a startup. Let's think about what it takes to run a startup. And the interesting thing is you step people from bottom to top through the scaling model. That's where you can have very targeted conversations on things like, well, when you move the state transition from team to team of teams, that's where you get into all those interesting hard questions about coordination and what do we do about you know, the time wasters and dependencies. And you, know, you can't just assume that they aren't ever going to be there. So it also gets past, you know, some, again, some of the religious debate. Important conceptual point, um, whichever of the dimensions you choose, you have to collapse the other two. So if you choose to teach along a scaling narrative, then you have to collapse both stack and life cycle. So the basic theme is you need full stack, full life cycle education from day one for students in, you know, to really understand the DevOps and digital transformation we're going through. And this is exactly what I do. So I am an architect. I have Visio on my laptop. Ooh. I also have Vagrant, VirtualBox, Chef DK, and a set of seven virtual machines with Java Ant, JUnit, Git, Jenkins Artifactory, and Nagios in an end-to-end -end continuous delivery pipeline. All runs on a MacBook Air. It's pretty cool. I use it for teaching and experimentation. You can do stuff with virtualization that would have required millions of dollars in capital for education years ago. Classes are a blast. We stand up four or five of these things and abuse them, get the students swarming around them and supporting each other. If you uh, submit pull requests to improve the system, you get extra credit. It's just beginning to dawn on faculty what you can do with this stuff. Um, it's all defined as code on GitHub, a master vagrant file, a bunch of chef recipes. I haven't got to Docker yet. I'll get there next year, folks. You know, it, it, there is a lag with academia. I'm sorry. But you know, there's a difference between being three miles behind moving at the same speed versus falling further and further behind. I'm happy being three miles behind as long as I'm moving at the same speed. So going forward, you know, um, I think I'll, I'll get we're here roughly on time here. Um, we're considering putting the overall guidance in some kind of online system like a Stack Overflow so that we can collaborate on these learning objectives and they're not being held too close to some, you know, insular group. I want broader community participation. And in terms of what you can do, here are some ideas, you know, look to your local university advisory boards. Um, you know, look to your tech lobbying associations, your university should be willing to hear from you. They have a slower feedback cycle, but they do have feedback channels. You just have to be a little more patient. And in conclusion, what I would ask for help with, send your faculty friends to dynamicit.education. And then what I need help with is have a look at the report. Are the competency areas or the structure, are we on target? Is it the best we can do? and think about how we could do this more collaboratively and collectively. And then finally, uh, I do have an interest in what we, how we would ultimately relate this also to commercial training and that whole space. That would probably be a whole other talk. So I think we're probably right on it, right? Yep. Yeah, they did, yeah, they didn't, uh, oh, okay, they, well, it says four feet, oh, I do. I was, I was basing this on my, uh, so here, I'll just, uh, so the reason, I have one thing to, uh, I have, um, do that, um, and, um, since I have a minute, I'll just, people ask, go ahead, but I'll just tell a joke. So why did I call my pipeline the Calavera Project? I googled walking skeleton, and I got two major classes of, of, uh, in, of uh, imagery. So I could have either gone with the Grateful Dead or Dia de los Muertos. So I went with Dia de los Muertos as kind of the, <laughs> the conceit for the, the Calavera Project. Anyways, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, question about not the content but the form in, in addition to topics that are missing yes there's also uh, in computer science people are taught lecture style they are certified and they give answers to questions about best practices where we need people to be able to learn how to learn and does your curriculum address 
not only what people know, but how they can learn moving forward into their careers? The report does not address pedagogy. We deliberately took that out. I mean, it has just a couple pages on it because it would have, the scope would have blown open. Okay. Mostly the report is about just providing people cited learning objectives and like 100 references. Okay. That's the bottom line value. The second, real quick, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the culture section, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, does do human sciences fit into that anthropology? We, we call for, we, we note that one of, one of the notable fact, uh, phenomena in the DevOps community right now is the increasing um, openness to pulling in human factors and operations research. We specifically mentioned John Allspaw's contributions there and bringing in people like Sidney Decker. Um, we don't mention anthropology specifically, no. Yeah. Um, have you interacted at all with the uh, Georgia Tech group that's doing the online master's in computer science program? That's, I mean, they've had a lot of announcements lately about what they're doing there. Just wondering if you've... No, no. I've had interactions with a few, uh, a few, a few different folks around, around the, actually around the world, but not them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Pat, shoot me their contact info. Yeah. yeah. There was another one. Behind you? Is it behind me? Right behind uh, more of a basic question. There's a lot of material here. Yes, sorry. What, is, is, is there a top takeaway, um, like for us who are here? Like, how does it matter to us, and, and what should we do about it? Well, it depends on sense. your role. If you're, if you're a hiring manager, I mm -hmm. think the, take, the takeaway is this is the beginning of a conversation you could have with your local higher education advisory boards. Mm -hmm. That would be the takeaway I would suggest if you're, uh, and it's the, 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 kind of the assumption is, is this would be of interest to hiring managers. Um, I could think more, but I'd be kind of sitting up here kind of thinking out loud. We could talk more af afterward. It's a good question. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So what you said really resonated with me because um, I work at Lockheed Martin. I've been there for 22 years, and I mm -hmm. try really hard to bring new teams up to mm -hmm. speed, right, in, in Agile and DevOps, and it's a struggle. But you're right, we hire a lot of computer science majors. They don't understand why the product matters. It only matters that they've gotten some code. You're lucky if you got them to think it's important to compile. Um, I'd really like to engage in this because I think I can see a solution that hadn't occurred to me before. Let's keep in touch. Thank you. Appreciate it. One more. We got one more. And then we got to. Yeah, great. Okay. Sorry. Um, I actually do a lot of work with my alma mater. Through the, I sit on the School Business Advisory Council. Great. And, and, but it's a public university, so in a pretty large public university system. Can you give some, some advice on how to articulate benefits of, of doing this to help sell it to them? Because it's a, it's a really hard thing to change the... The I, curriculum within a public university? So. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it starts with the fact that the public university has a social mission, you know, and I think if you frame it in those terms, is there's, there's an obligation to the students, there's an obligation to the stakeholders. Um, starting with the State of DevOps report might be a, as good a place to start as any, and, and I would invite you to take a couple copies of, the, of this report because it does talk about the why. I mean, it starts with the executive summary and executive positioning. Thank you all, appreciate it.